THE BURIAL OF THE TITHE by Samuel Lover Part 1 With the help of a surgeon, he might yet recover. Shakespeare It was a fine morning in the autumn of 1832, and the sun had not yet rubbed the grass of its dew. As a stout-built peasant was moving briskly along a small by-road in the country of Tipperary, the elasticity of his step bespoke the lightness of his heart, and the rapidity of his walk did not seem sufficient, even for the exuberance of his glee, for every now and then the walk was exchanged for a sort of dancing shuffle, which terminated with a short capering kick that threw up the dust about him and all the while he whistled one of those whismical jig tunes with which ireland abounds and twirled his stick over his head in a triumphal flourish then off he started again in his original pace and hummed a rollicking song and occasionally broke out into soliloquy why then and isn't the great day entirely for Ireland? That is, in this blessed day. Who, oh, your soul to glory, but well to the job complete. And here he got a caper. Devil a more they'll ever get, and it's only a pity they ever got any. But there's an end of them now. They cut down from this out. And here he made an appropriate down stroke of his shillelagh through a bunch of thistles that skirt the road. Where will be their grand doings now? Eh? I'd like to know that. Where'll their be lazy livering servants? Oh, whoa! And he sprang lightly over a stile. And what will they do for their coaches and for? Here, a lark sprang up at his feet and darted into the air with his thrilling rush of exquisite melody. Fate, you've given me my answer sure enough, my poor Dillard. That's as much as to say they may go whistle for them. Oh, my poor fellows, how pity ye is. And here he broke into a turala loo and danced along the path. Then, suddenly dropping into silence, he resumed his walk and applying his hand behind his head, cocked up his coffin and began to rub behind his ear, according to the most approved peasant practice of assisting the power of reflection. Fix, and it's myself that's puzzled to know well the proctors and the process savers and praises do at all. By Gora, they must go rough on the road, since they won't be let to rough any more in the fields. Rubbing is all that is left for them. For sure they couldn't turn to any honest trade after the courses they have been used to. Oh, what a power of miscreants will be out of bread for the want of their old trade or false swearing. Why, the vagabonds will be lost, barring their scent to bot. And indeed, if a bridge could be built of false oaths, by my soakings they could swear themselves there without wetting their feet. Here he overtook another peasant, whom he accosted with the universal salutation of God save you. God save you kindly, was returned for an answer. And is it yourself that's there, Mikey Noonan? said the one first introduced to the reader. Indeed it's myself, and nobody else, said Noonan. And where is it you're going this fine morning? And... Is it yourself that's axing that same Mikey? Why, where is I would be going but to the bearing? I thought so in trot. It's yourself that is always ripe and ready for fun, and a small blame to me. Why then, it was a mighty complete thing, whoever it was that thought of making a bearing out of it. And don't you know? Not to my knowledge. Why then, who'd you think now laid it all out? Fakes, I don't know. Maybe that's Peter Connolly. No, it wasn't. Though Peter's a cute chap. Guess again. Well, was it Phil Mulligan? No, it wasn't. 
though you made a good offer at it sure enough, for it wasn't Phil, it was his sister. They're alive, is it Biddy it was? Skeered to the one else? Oh, she's the curious creature in life. There is not that trick out that's not up to, and more besides. By the powders or war, she'd bait a field full of lawyers at scheming. She's the devil's pity. Why, Dean, but it was a great idea entirely. You may say that, in truth. Maybe it's we won't have the fun. But see who's before us there. Isn't that old Krugan? Sure enough, by that. Why, Dean, isn't he the real fine old cock to come so far to see the rights of the thing? Fex, he was always the right sort. Sure, in ninety-eight, as I hear, he was maltreated a power, and his place rummaged, and himself almost killed, because he couldn't inform on his neighbors. God's blessing be an him and the likes of him that couldn't prove traitor to a friend in distress. Here they came up with the old man to whom they alluded. He was the remains of a stately figure, and his white hair hung at some length round the back of his head and his temples, while a black and well-marked eyebrow overshadowed his keen grey eye. The contrast of the dark eyebrow to the white hair rendered the intelligent cast of his features more striking, as he was altogether a figure that one would not be likely to pass without notice. He was riding a small horse at an easy pace, and he answered the rather respectful salutation of the two foot passengers with kindness and freedom. They addressed him as Mr. Coogan, while to them he returned the familiar term voice. And of course it's going to the very end you are, Mr. Coogan, and long life to you. Ay, boys, it is hard for an old horse to leave off his tricks. Old is it? Fakes, and it's yourself that has more heart in you this blessed morning than many a man that's not half your age. By that I'm not a cold boys, though I kick up my heels sometimes. Well, you'll never do it younger, sir. But sure, why wouldn't you be there when all the country's going, I hear? And no wonder, sure. By the hole in my head is enough. So it is to make a sick man leave his bed to see the fun that'll be in it. And sure it's right and proper and shows the spirit that is in the country when a man like yourself, Mr. Coogan, joins the poor people in doing it. I like to stand up for the right, answered the old man, and always was a good warrant to do that same, said Larry in his most laudatory tone. Will you tell us who's that furnish us and the road there? asked the old man, as he pointed to a person that seemed to make his way with some difficulty, for he labored under an infirmity of limb that caused a grotesque jerking action in his walk, if walk it might be called. Why, Dean, don't you know him, Mr. Coogan? By that I thought there wasn't a parish in the country that didn't know poor Hoopy Holigan. It has been often observed before the love of sobriquet that the Irish possess but let it not be supposed that their nicknames are given in a spirit of unkindness, far from it. A sense of the ridiculous is so closely interwoven in a Irish nature, that he will even jest upon his own misfortunes, and while he indulges in a joke, one of the few indulgences he can command, the person that excites it, may as frequently be the object of his open-heartedness as his mirth. And is that Hoppy Hooligan? said old Coogan. I often heard of him, to be sure, but I never seen him before. Oh, then, you may see him before and behind now, said Larry. And indeed, if he had a match for that odd skirt of his coat, he wouldn't be the worse of it. 
and if trod, the corduroys themselves aren't a bit too good, and there is the least taste in life of his. Whisht, said the old man. He's looking back, and maybe he hears you. Not he in trot, sure he's partly bothered. How can he play the fiddle then and be bothered? said Coogan. Fix, and that's the very reason he is bothered. Sure he moiders the ears off of him entirely with the noise of his own fiddle. Oh, he's a powerful fiddler. So I often hear, indeed, said the old man. He bangs all the fiddlers in the country, and is in the greatest request, added Noonan. Yet he looks tattered enough, said old Coogan. Sure you never seen a well-dressed fiddler yet, said Larry. Indeed, and now you remind me, I believe not, said the old man. I suppose they all get more kicks than half pence, as the saying is. Devil a many kicks hooligan gets. He's a great favorite entirely. Why is he in such distress then? asked Coogan. Fate he's not in distress at all. He's welcome everywhere he goes, and has the best of eating and drinking the place affords wherever he is, and picks up the coppers fast at the first, and is no way necessitated in life, though indeed it can't be denied as he limps along there, that he has a great many ups and downs in the world. This person, of whom the preceding dialogue treats, was a celebrated fiddler in these parts, and his familiar name of Hoopy Holligan was acquired, as the reader may already have perceived, from his limping gait. This limp was a consequence of a broken leg, which was one of the consequences of an affray which is the certain consequence of a fair in Tipperary. Hooligan was a highly characteristic specimen of an Irish fiddler. As Larry Lanigan said, you never seen a well-dressed fiddler yet, but Hooligan was a particularly ill-fledged bird of the musical tribe. His corduroys have already been hinted at by Larry, as well as his coat, which had lost half the skirt, thereby partially revealing the aforesaid corduroys. Or, if one might be permitted to indulge in an image, the half-skirt that remained served to produce a partial eclipse of the disc of cordury. This was what we painters call picturesque. By the way, the vulgar are always amazed that some tattered remains of anything is more prized by the painter than the freshest production in all its gloss of novelty. The fiddler's stockings, too, in the neglected falling of their folds round his leg, and the wisp of a straw that fringed the opening of his gaping brogues, were valuable additions to the picture, and his hat... But stop, let me not presume. His hat it would be a vain attempt to describe, there are two things not to be described, which, to know what they are, you must see. These two things are Taglioni's dancing and an Irish fiddler's head. The one is a wonder in action, the other an enigma in form. Hooligan's fiddle was a great curiosity as himself, and like its master, somewhat the worse of wear. It had been broken some score of times, and yet, by dint of glue, was continued in what an antiquary could call a fine state of preservation. That is to say, there was rather more of glue than wood in the article. The stringing of the instrument was a great a piece of patchwork as itself, and exhibited great ingenuity on the part of its owner. Many was the knot above the fingerboard and below the bridge, that is, when the fiddle was in the best order, for in case of fractures on the field of action, that is to say, at way, patron, or fair, where the fiddler, unlike the girl he was playing for, had not two strings to his bow. In such case, I say, the old string should be knotted, whatever it might require to be, 
and I have heard it insinuated that the music was not a bit the worst of it. Indeed, the only economy that poor Hooligan ever practiced was in the strings of his fiddle, and those were an admirable exemplification of the proverb of making both ends meet. Hooligan's waistcoat, too, was a curiosity, or rather a cabinet of curiosities, for he appropriated its pockets to various purposes. A snuff, resin, tobacco, a clasp knife with a half blade, a piece of flint, a tootin, and some bits of twine and ends of fiddle strings were all huddled together promiscuously. Hooligan himself called his waistcoat Noah's Ark, for, as he said himself, there was a little of everything in it, barring money, and that would never stay in his company. His fiddle, partly enfolded in a scanty bit of old vase, was tucked under his left arm, and his right was employed in helping him to hobble along by means of a black thorn stick. When he was overtaken by the three travelers already named, and saluted by all, with the addition of a query as to where he was going. And where would I be going but the Verin? said Hooligan. Trot is the same answer I expected, said Lanigan. It could be nothing at all without you. I've played at many weddings, said Hooligan, but I'm thinking there will be more fun at this Verin than at any ten weddings. Indeed, you may say that, Hopi. Agra, said Noonan. Why, Dean, Hopi Jewel, said Lanigan. What did the skirt of your coat do to you, that you left it behind you, and wouldn't let it see the fun? Did, then, I'll tell you, Larry, my boy. I was going last night by the by-road that runs up the back of the old house. Nigh hand, the witty cases, and I hear that people was living in it since I traveled the road last, and so I opened the old iron gate that was as stiff in the hinge as a miser's fist, and the road ladding up to the house, looking as lonely as a churchyard, and the grass growing out through it, and says I to myself, I'm thinking it's few darkness your doors, says I. God be with the time the old squire was here, that stayed at home and didn't go abroad out his own country, letting the fine stately old place go to rack and ruin. And faith, I was turning back, and I wish I did, when I see a man coming down the road, and so I waited till he came up to me, and I asked him if anyone was up at the house. Jeez, says he, and with that I hear terrible barking entirely, and a great big lump of a dog turned the corner of the house and stood crawling at me. I'm afraid this dog's in it, says I to the man. Jeez, said he, but they're quiet. So with that I wind my way, and he wind his way. But my jewels, the minute I got into the yard, nine great vagabonds of dogs fell on me, and I thought they'd ate me alive, and so they could, I believe. Only I had a cold bones of mate, and some practice that Mrs. McGrain, God bless her, made me put in my pocket when I was going the road, as I was leaving her house that morning, after the christening that was in it. And sure enough, lashings and lavings was there. Oh, that's the woman has a heart as big as a king's, and her husband too, in truth. He's a decent man, and keeps mightily fine drink in his house. Well, as I was saying, the gold maid and pratties was in my pocket, and by God the thieving murdering villains of dogs may a dart at the pocket, and dragged it clan up, and thin, my dear, with fighting among themselves, striving to come at the maid, the skirt of my coat was in smithereens in one minute, devil a lie in it, not a tatter if I was left together, and it's only a wonder I came off with my life. Fade, I think so, said Lanigan, and wasn't it mightily providential they didn't come at the fiddle? Sure, 
What would the country do then? Sure enough, you may say that, said Hooligan. And then my bread would be gone as well as my mate. But think of the unnatural vagabond that told me the dogs was quiet. Sure, he came back while I was there. And I ups and I told him what a shame it was to tell me the dogs was quiet. So they are quiet, says he. Sure, there is nine of them, and only seven of them bites. Thank you, says I. There was something irresistibly comic in the quiet manner that Hooligan said. Thank you, says I. And the account of his canine adventure altogether excited much mirth amongst his auditors. As they pursued their journey, many a joke was passed and repartee returned and the laugh rang loudly and often from the merry little group as they trudged along. In the course of the next mile's march, their numbers were increased by some half-dozen that, one by one, suddenly appeared by leaping over the hedge on the road, or crossing a stile from some neighboring path. All these newcomers pursued the same route, and each gave the same answer when asked, where he was going. It was universally this. Why then, where could I be going but to the Bering? At a neighboring confluence of roads, straggling parties of from four to five were seen in advance and approaching in the rear, and the highway soon began to wear the appearance it is wont to do on the occasion of a patron, a fair, or a market day. Larry Lanigan was in evident enjoyment at this increase of numbers, and as the crowd thickened, his exultation increased, and he often repeated his ejaculation, already noticed in Larry's opening soliloquy. Why then, and isn't it a great day entirely for Ireland? And now horsemen were more frequently appearing, and their numbers soon amounted to almost a cavalcade and sometimes a car, that is to say, the car common to the country for agricultural purposes, might be seen bearing a cargo of women, Videlicet, the wood woman, herself and her rosy-cheeked daughters, and maybe a cousin or two, with an aide-de-camp, on to assist in looking after the young ladies. The roughness of the motion of this primitive vehicle was rendered as accommodating as possible to the gentler sex by a plentiful shake-down of clean straw on the car, over which a feather bed was laid, and the best quilt in the house over that, to make all smart possibly a piece of hexagon patchwork of the mistress herself, in which the tradiest calico pattern served to display the taste of the rural seamstress and stimulated the rising generation to feats of needlework. The car was always provided with a driver, who took such care upon himself, for a reason he had. He was almost universally what is called in Ireland a clean boy, that is to say, a well-made, good-looking young fellow, whose eyes were not put into his head for nothing and these same eyes might be seen wandering backwards occasionally from his immediate charge, the dumb base to take a squint at some, or maybe one of his passengers. This explains the reason he had for becoming a driver. Sometimes he sat on the crupper of the horse, resting his feet on the shafts of the car, and bending down his head to say something tender to the colleen that sat next to him, totally negligent of his duty as guide. Sometimes when the girl he wanted to be sweet on was seated at the back of the car, this relieved the horse from the additional burden of his driver, and the clean boy could lift the horse head and fall in the rear to the luther the creature, depending on the occasional hop or woo for the guidance of the beast, when a too near proximity to the dike by the roadside warned him of the necessity of his interference. Sometimes he was called to his duty by the open remonstrance of either the mother or the aunt, 
or maybe a mischievous cousin as does. Why then, Dinny, what are you about at all, at all? God between me and harm, if you weren't within an inch of putting us all in the gripe of the ditch. Array, leave off your gusset in there, and mind the horse, will you? A pretty thing if you'd be if my bones was broke. What are you doing there, at all at the back of the car, when it's at the base head you ought to be? Ara, sure, the base knows the way herself. Fex, I believe so, for it's little beholden to you. She's for the showing her. Ah, murder. There we are in the gripe at most. Lave over your screeching, can't you, and be quiet. Sure the poor creature only just went over to get a mouthful of the grass by the side of the ditch. What business has she to be eating now? Because she's hungry, I suppose. And why isn't she fed better? Because rocks stales her oats, Dinny. I seen you in the stable by the same token yesterday. Sure enough, ma'am, for I went there to look for my coal that was missing. I thought it was the filly you wore after, Dinny, said a cousin with a wink. And Dinny grinned, and his sweetheart blushed, while the rest of the girls tittered. The mother pretended not to hear the joke and bidding Dinny to go mind his business by attending the horse. But lest I should tire my reader by keeping him so long on the road, I will let him find the rest of his way as well as he can to a certain romantic little valley, where a comfortable farmhouse was situated beside a small mountain stream that tumbled along noisily over its rocky bed, and in which some dogs noisier than the stream, were enjoying their morning bath. The geese were indulging in dignified rest and silence upon the bank. A cock was crowing and strutting with his usual swagger amongst his hens. A pig was endeavoring to save his ears, not from his rural tumult, but from the teeth of a half-terrier dog, who was chasing him away from an iron pot full of potatoes, which the pig had dared to attempt some impertinent liberties with, and a girl was bearing into the house a pail of milk which she had just taken from the cow that stood placidly looking on, an admirable contrast to the general bustle of the scene. Everything about the cottage gave evidence of comfort on the part of its owner, and to judge from the numbers without and within the house, you would say he did not want for friends, for all, as they arrived at his door, greeted Philemon O'Hara kindly, and Philemon welcomed each newcomer with a heartiness that did honor to his gray hairs. Frequently passing to and fro, busily engaged in arranging an ample breakfast in the barn, appeared his daughter, a pretty round-faced girl with black hair and the long and silky lashed dark gray eyes of her country where merriment loves to dwell and a rosy mouth whose smile served at once to display her good temper and her fine teeth her color gets fresher for a moment and a look of affectionate recognition brightens her eye as a lithe young fellow springs briskly over the stepping stones that lead across the stream and trips lightly up to the girl who offers her hand in welcome who is the happy dog that is so well received by honor o'hara the prettiest girl in that parish or the next and the daughter of a snug man into the bargain it is the reader's old acquaintance Larry Lanigan. And maybe Larry did not give a squeeze extraordinary to the hand that was presented to him. The father received him well also. Indeed, for that matter, the difficulty would have been to find a house in the whole district that Larry would not have been welcome in. So here you are at last, Larry, said old O'Hara. I was wondering you were not here long ago. And so I could, I thank you kindly, said Larry. Only I overtook old Hopi here on the road, and sure I thought I might as well. 
take my time and wait for poor Hoppy and bring my welcome along with me. And here he shoved the fiddler into the house before him. The girls will be glad to see the pair of jeers, said the old man following. The interior of the house was crowded with guests, and the usual laughing and courting so often described as common to such assemblages were going forward amongst the young people. At the farther end of the largest room in the cottage, a knot of the older men of the party was engaged in the discussion of some subject that seemed to carry deep interest along with it, and at the opposite extremity of the same room a coffin of very rude construction lay on a small table, and around this coffin stood all the junior part of the company, male and female and the wildness of their mirth, and the fertility of their jest over this tenement of mortality and its contents, might have well startled a stranger for a moment, until he saw the nature of the deposit the coffin contained. Enshrouded in a sheaf of wheat lay a pig, between whose open jaws a large potato was placed, and the coffin was otherwise grotesquely decorated. The reader will wonder, no doubt, at such an exhibition, for certainly never was coughing so applied before, and it is therefore necessary to explain the meaning of all this, and I believe Ireland is the only country in the world where the facts I am about to relate could have occurred. It may be remembered that some time previously to the date at which my story commences, His Majesty's Minister declared that there should be a total extinction of tithes. This declaration was received in Ireland by the great mass of the people with the utmost delight as they fancied they should never have tithes to pay again. The peasantry in the neighborhood of Templemore formed the very original idea of burying the tithe. It is only amongst an imaginative people that such a notion could have originated, and indeed there is something highly poetical in the conception. The tithe, that which the poor felt the keenest, that which they considered a tax on their industry, that which they looked upon as an hereditary oppression, that hateful thing, they were told, was to be extinct, and, in joyous anticipation of the blessing, they determined to enact an emblematic interment of this terrible enemy. I think it is not too much to call this idea a fine one, and yet, in the execution of it, they invested it with the broadest marking of the grotesque. Such is the strange compound of an Irish peasant, whose anger is often vented in a jest, and whose mirth is sometimes terrible. I must here pause for a moment, and request it to be distinctly understood, that, in relating this story, in giving the facts connected with it, and in stating what the Irish peasants' feelings are respecting tight, I have not the most distant notion of putting forward any opinions of my own, on the subject. In the pursuit of my own quiet art, I am happily far removed from the fierce encounter of politics, and I do not wish to offend against the feelings or opinions of any one in my little volume, and I trust, therefore, that I may be permitted to give a sketch of a characteristic incident as it came to my knowledge without being mistaken for a partisan. I tell the tale as it was told to me. I have said a group of seniors was collected at one end of the room, and as it is meet to give precedence to age, I will endeavor to give some idea of what was going forward amongst them. There was one old man of the party whose furrowed forehead, compressed eyebrows, peaked nose, and mouth depressed at the corners at once indicated to a physiognomist a querulous temper. He was one of your doubters upon all occasions, one of the unfailing elements of an argument, as he said himself, 
he was Doversome about everything, and he had hence earned the name of Daddy Doversome amongst his neighbors. Well, Daddy began to doubt the probability that any such boon as the extinction of the tides was to take place, and said he was certain sure that's too good news to be true. There are no indeed, said another who was the very antithesis of Daddy in his credulous nature. Sure, didn't I see it myself in print? I was told often that things was in print, returned Daddy dryly. That come out lies after, to my own knowledge. But sure, added a third, sure didn't the prime ear himself lay it all out before the parliament? What prime ear are you talking about, man dear? said Daddy rather testily. Why, the prime ear of his majesty, and no less. Is that satisfaction for you, eh? Well, and who is the prime ear? Why, the prime ear of his majesty, I told you before. You see, he is the one that hears of everything that is to be done for the whole empire, in particular, and because he hears of everything, that is the reason he's called the prime ear, and a good reason it is. Well, but what has that to do with the tides, I ask you again, said Daddy with his usual pertinacity. Here he was about to be answered by the former speaker, whose definition of the prime ear had won him golden opinions amongst the bystanders, when he was prevented by a fourth orator who rushed into the debate with this very elegant opening. All right, their announces are setting me mad. So yes are. Why, I wonder... Anyone I'd be such a fool as to argue with that crooked old disciple there? Meaning me? said Daddy. I'd be sorry to contradict you, sir, said the other with an admirable mockery of politeness. Thank you, sir, said Daddy, with a dignity more comical than the other's buffonery. You're kindly welcome, Daddy, returned the aggressor. Sure you never believed anything yet? And I wonder anyone would throw away their time striving to rectify you. Come, boys, said O'Hara, interrupting the discourse with a view to prevent further bickering. There is no use talking about the thing now, for whatever way it is, sure we are met to bury the tide, and it's proud I am to see you all here to make merry upon the strength of it. And I think I hear honor said this minute that everything is ready in the barn without, so you'll have no difference of opinion about tackling to the breakfast, or I am mistaken. Come, my heart is, the mate and the practice is crying, who laid me? Away with you, that's your sword, and he enforced.